Welcome back to Realism Overhaul. All I have to say is Icarus has returned. After months of design and flight testing, we've come up with something that works reliably, able to reach low Earth orbit and return safe and sound. Now, right off the bat, I know what some of you are thinking. A top-mounted shuttle, oh great, what is N9 doing? Well, today I'm going to show you what might be my favorite creation to Realism Overhaul. Uh, so far, the Icarus Mark II on its debut flight into low Earth orbit and back to the runway that you see in the background. Abort Mode 1. This is the most dangerous part of any Icarus mission, funny enough. Lifting off of the pad atop a specially modified two-stage nebula, its main stage only having three of the typical six F1A engines. Should any of these three fail shortly after liftoff, the only way to save the crew is to rapidly eject fuel from the first stage. Since tank pressures and domino effects of explosions aren't necessarily a worry in Kerbal Space Program, our primary concern is bringing the thrust to weight ratio back above 1.0. With only two engines running, we would fall with little hope of crew survival if we didn't do this. So it's the only way. Abort Mode 2, after we're clearing the tower and reaching a few kilometers in altitude, uh, this mode is reached and it will remain all the way through first stage separation. So what this one is, is should any engine failure occur and be deemed critical, a return to launch site abort will be performed. So this entails shutting down the main engines, separation, igniting the second stage, uh, four J2S engines, which will then whip around and orient backwards to get Icarus, uh, it's sort of a reversal maneuver, to either gain or lose speed or altitude based on many factors such as distance from the launch site, current altitude, and current surface speed. Uh, but the overall goal of Abort Mode 2 is to propel Icarus into a glide slope to once again line up with the launch site, although backwards. And this has actually been performed successfully in simulations in a variety of different circumstances, ranging from mere minutes into flight, all the way up to stage separation, and I gotta say, it's a fun maneuver to pull off. Um, on stream when testing these aborts, I actually used the second stage of Nebula to propulsively land, standing up on the engines, <laughs> although this tactic would never be used in an actual mission. It was absolutely hilarious to attempt. Throttleable engines are a game changer, and I'll leave it at that. Abort Mode 3 is utilized when we have lost two or more engines on the second stage, in a position where returning to the launch site is impossible. Here we would simply use the remaining engines to try and target somewhere with land, brace for the G-forces involved, and touch down anywhere on Earth that we possibly can. So we're not targeting a runway, we're just targeting survival, no matter where we're gonna end up. Fortunately, abort modes 1 and 2 pass without incident as we approach burnout of the first stage. I just wanted to briefly go over abort modes right away, as I'm sure some of you may be worried about keeping our crew alive during an emergency with such an odd launch configuration, although it is reminiscent of the first Icarus. If you remember from this series, our first Kerbal into low Earth orbit was on a tiny space plane that was top mounted on I think a Sparrow? Rocket? I don't remember what we called everything in the early games, but so this is... Yeah, as much as I didn't want it to be a top-mounted shuttle, it's a callback to that, which is which is nice. Uh, but as I said, liftoff is the most dangerous, but everything afterwards is kind of a piece of cake, really. Well, a piece of cake flying at really low frame rates with physics practically locked at 40% real time, so a jittery slow motion piece of cake, we'll say. <laughs> the footage on screen right now is sped up to 240%. So what we're seeing is pretty close to real time in all actuality. There are parts of the video that are sped up more than that, and some that aren't sped up as much. It's sort of, it sort of varies, uh, but it's a smooth ride up thanks to the good old Nebula, the powerhouse of our space program. It's really putting in the work. One of the more interesting aspects of the development process for the shuttle was, okay, how on earth do we launch this thing? Like speaking of, we didn't have the RS-25 engines unlocked quite yet. So for a long time, the shuttle was fitted with two HG-3 engines instead, 
a similar concept engine that was slightly smaller. Uh, they would light on the ground and propel the vehicle into orbit much like STS, however with a much weirder looking vehicle and launch configuration, for sure. Uh, we also didn't have shuttle SRBs, so we were going to be using UA-1208s maybe, uh, we tried F1 stick boosters, we tried like a slipper tank design which was just so weird. I came up with a lot of ideas and most of them were just way too awkward to implement, even though some of them may have worked. Uh, when I started designing, Twitch chat told me time and time again to just launch it on Nebula, and I pushed that idea into the back of the line because frankly I didn't want to have a top mountain shuttle. I didn't want to have to deal with the awkward rear end of the vehicle connecting to a conical fuel tank, but when I saw the numbers in the editor, I gave up. Nebula Icarus was going to be a thing, and I had to slap together a whole bunch of procedural fairings and B9 wing parts to cobble up some sort of adapter, which as you saw before works like a charm. I'm pretty proud of how it turned out. And now we see the shuttle in its most comfortable environment, Earth orbit. The first two shuttle missions are, in all practicality, demonstration flights. The first one is to demonstrate launch, orbit, spacecraft deployment, and return. And now is a great time to reveal the very first shuttle payload to be deployed. Twitch chat demanded this, by the way, a sounding rocket. Like the very first all of us launch at the beginning of every realism overhaul save. But this Araby will attempt to perform a lunar impact after being deployed able to spin stabilize and orient itself with an onboard reaction wheel. Space bees to the moon, I can't resist. Some of you may have noticed a small explosion shortly after shuttle separation and well not to worry that was just the small rocket motor meant to ullage the space bee, called lunar stinger accordingly, uh, but I didn't check my staging and ended up destroying it on accident by lighting it inside the cargo bay. Oh well, if something had to malfunction on this mission, I'm happy it's not the primary vehicle at least. I'm perfectly okay with the Araby failing, so uh, we're pretty much testing the deployment, so if it misses the moon, if it blows up, if it fails, I could care less. Uh, but we're going to deploy the Space Bee, which we'll do on EVA, and yeah, mostly to demonstrate how the large vehicle, or how large the vehicle really is compared to the size of these Kerbals, I should say. Aro likes to upscale parts to be more realistic for human-sized vehicles, so these stock parts that are enlarged might give the illusion that it's smaller than it really is. As for size and capability, the Icarus Mark II can hold 7 Kerbals with enough supply for 2 weeks, much longer for smaller crews. It can carry roughly 35 tons into low Earth orbit, with a cargo bay size of 3.4 by 12 meters. So smaller than STS for sure we aren't able to deploy very large habitats with this vehicle, but retrieval is the vehicle's primary purpose at concept level, and we shouldn't ever need to return anything bigger than 3.4 meters, I imagine. Our EVA will also deploy two rotation rate indicators on Lunar Stinger so the crew can monitor its spin stabilization before ignition of the Araby, assuming tank pressure alone is enough to ensure proper lighting. Now let's try to smack the moon! Not with the shuttle, of course, but with Lunar Stinger, which luckily does in fact fire even without the ullage motor. Space B is away. Spin stabilization working somewhat effectively, we at least remain pointing in the right direction. In hindsight, I should have included something for mid-course correction, because I totally missed. Uh, Lunar Stinger's gonna way overshoot, but not enough to leave the Earth's influence gravitationally, so it'll basically be on this very, very eccentric orbit and re-enter the atmosphere after a few of them, maybe a few weeks. And that's when its mission will come to an end, although realistically its mission has already come to an end. Now the idea was to simply deploy it from the cargo bay, so mission successful, mission accomplished. Now using our experience in countless re-entry simulations, using the mod trajectories to help, it's time to burn for home. A small burn is all that's needed, and we orient the shuttle in a 30 degrees angle of attack. This is maintained very smoothly for most of the re-entry. All we have to do to ensure this works so well every mission is to make sure the center of mass is in the same place every re-entry, rear loading anything we bring back to be more specific. Though the bay is empty for this test, so we don't have to worry about that yet. So now the first shuttle prepares to take its plunge a process that takes about a half hour, but luckily for us, I can speed up the footage. 
After getting a little spicy and throwing sonic booms down at Florida, our speed is low enough, a full turn can be performed. The re-entry went very well. We ended up slightly overshooting and slightly to the south of our intended target, but it is well within nominal parameters and we'll be able to target our runway perfectly fine. Once we reach speeds of about 3000 meters per second, we are able to perform, I, I guess you would call it an S turn like STS, where you can aggressively turn full 360. You could rotate all the way around to basically fine tune your final approach or the area of your final approach. But we didn't necessarily have to do it on this flight but it is a very cool thing that you can only do between the speeds of 3K and 2K because if you do it any lower than 2K, you will stall out and just flip the vehicle and destroy it any higher than that. And the same thing was, is likely to happen. So there's a very small window where you can perform that. But wait, there is not just one Icarus mission in this video. Call right now and receive two Icarus missions for the price of one video. <laughs> We've, we're displaying the second flight here. The second flight of Icarus Mark II is meant to demonstrate its primary function, orbital retrieval. Its target is the Advent Block A mission extension module. That spacecraft was crewed for one month by an early Aurora mission a handful of episodes previously. Since then, it has been inactive and uncrewed for several years at this point. So it's time to come home. The reason why I'm bringing this back is twofold. One is lower, two is uh, usefulness, right? So we have unlocked a lot of the tech tree. I don't think I've really displayed it much in this series, but we're most of the way through the realism overhaul tech tree, which is just awesome. Um, and we're going to have way better parts for building stations with, should we do that? And this tiny little closet in orbit of the earth just isn't useful for us whatsoever. Uh, lore wise, the second part or first part, I don't remember which one I said first, we're bringing it back to study the effects of solar radiation and the hostile space environment on habitats in order to build habitats that can better withstand that situation, those environments. And what better way of doing that than to throw something up in orbit, leave it there for years, and then go bring it back and see what happened and that way we can develop more modules and spacecraft that can basically protect what's inside of it, fuel, cargo, crew, electronics, all that from radiation, micrometeorites, oh, all sorts of things. Plus, it's going to be a fantastic museum piece. Imagine, imagine like bringing back the Hubble Space Telescope or something and then that being in a museum. Like how cool, how cool would that be? Honestly, it's kind of a shame. It's kind of a shame that the space shuttle retired before it was able to perform a mission like that. And with things that have gone wrong with it and without being able to do any more repairs and stuff on it, it's only a limited amount of time before it eventually stops working. Um, we might be able to bring it back even if it stops working. I don't know, but it'd just be cool. I want to see Hubble in a museum, okay? Uh, but anyways, I have gone off track. We have a brand new shuttle, and will we see it again? Uh, who knows? But until whenever, thank you so much for watching, and peace out. Where